Welcome to the lecture on occlusion. The term occlusion means to close. This is what we are going to study about when the maxillary and the mandibular arches close leading to a intercuspation of the maxillary and the mandibular teeth. By definition, occlusion is the contact relationship of the teeth in function as well as in parafunctional activities. It means the contact of the teeth of the upper maxillary and the lower mandibular arches and this is an essential component for maintenance of the masticatory system. The proper occlusion leads to maintenance of homeostasis in the function of the teeth, oral cavity as well as the temporomandibular joint. It is an essential feature for maintenance of periodontal health as well as a temporomandibular joint health. We should remain cognizant about occlusion whenever we are doing restorations, be it a single tooth restoration or a complete denture fabrication. Both of them should have proper occlusion which will maintain homeostasis and periodontal as well as joint health. In this topic, we will be talking about development of occlusion, the compensatory curves which are involved in the dental arches, the functional form of the teeth at their occlusion as well as the occlusal contact and intercuspal relations in static as well as function of mastication. To begin with, let's look at development of occlusion. Occlusion develops in a dynamic fashion. We have two sets of teeth, deciduous as well as permanent dentition and there is an intervening mixed dentition phase. The way the teeth contact with each other is different in these three states, the deciduous dentition, mixed dentition as well as in the permanent dentition. When we look at deciduous dentition, the eruption generally begins by the month of 6 and the sequence of eruption is generally A, B, B, C and E. All the deciduous teeth are in occlusion by 2 years of age. The deciduous second molars come in contact with each other by 2 years. Posterior to the deciduous second molar, the tooth buds of the permanent teeth also starts to develop. These deciduous teeth remain in function till the age of 6 years, where the permanent molar starts erupting. This mixed dentition phase where the permanent as well as the deciduous teeth are in place is very crucial for maintenance of the occlusion. The sequence of eruption is ABDCE which generally follows the rule of 6. By the age of 6 months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months and 30 months. And the complete arch is established by 9 months of age where the growth of the jaws begin posteriorly and it expands giving rise to space for the 6 and the 7, the permanent first and the second molars. The occlusion in the primary dentition is a complex phenomenon. There is a synergy between the development of the muscle matrix associated with the growth of the facial skeleton. Simultaneously, there are nervous system development which leads to proper motor functions. Finally, the occlusion develops because of the synergy between all of these entities. The occlusion is placed in such a way that the muscles of the tongue in the lingual portion and the lips and the cheek in the outer portion are balanced. This balanced location where the forces in the region 1 and region 3 are maintained together is called as the neutral zone. The neutral zone is the location where the maxillary and the mandibular teeth remain in function. When you look at the primary arch, there are a few aspects according to which we read about the arch. When you look at an arch form in the maxilla, it is generally a U-shaped arch, similarly in the mandible but there are V-shaped arches that are present. In cases of clefts, as in this picture, the arch form is collapsed. The upper and the lower teeth contact with each other. 
when you look at this picture on the left you can see that the permanent incisors are bigger than the mandibular counterparts the permanent maxillary central incisor contacts with two incisors of the mandibular arch except for the third molars all the other teeth contact with two opposing counterparts the last primary molar that is the e the second deciduous molar contacts with each other in such a way that the distal portion is in line with each other this kind of occlusion is called as flush terminal plane wherein the mandibular second molar which is slightly bigger than the maxillary second molar compensates for the size differences of the mandibular teeth giving rise to a straight flush terminal plane discrepancy may occur when there is caries early extraction of previous teeth or trauma etc and it leads to two different types of planes in the distal portion it can be a distal step as shown in this figure wherein the mandibular molars are posteriorly placed to that of the maxillary molars leading to a distal step wherein the mandibular arch is posteriorly placed to that of the maxillary arch this kind leads to a class 2 occlusion wherein the mandibular teeth are posteriorly placed compared to that of the maxillary teeth sometimes the maxillary second molar is more posteriorly placed than that of the mandibular second molars this leads to a mesial step a mesial step gives rise to a typical class 3 malocclusion wherein the mandibular teeth are anterior to that of the maxillary teeth this kind of classification is called as molar occlusion relationship given by angles there are teeth three different types angles class 1 class 2 and class 3 angles class 1 is typically defined in such a way that the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary molar is in relation with the mesiobuccal groove of the mandibular first molar in this case the maxillary central incisor is slightly ahead of the mandibular central incisors this overlap which is horizontally 2 to 5 millimeters is called as overjet in angles class 2 and class 3 the mandibular relationship is different in class 2 position the mandibular teeth are more posteriorly placed than the maxillary teeth the overjet is more in class 3 the mandibular teeth is anterior to that of the maxillary teeth in this the overjet is reversed wherein the mandibular teeth are ahead of the maxillary teeth this is a typical example of a class 2 malocclusion here in the class 2 malocclusion the maxillary teeth compensate by outgrowing and coming out and covering the mandibular teeth completely it covers the complete mandibular anterior teeth this is an example of class 3 wherein the mandibular teeth are placed ahead of the maxillary teeth the deciduous dentition is unlike the permanent dentition there are spacings seen between each and every teeth this is called as physiological spaces this is mainly required because the permanent dentition are much bigger than that of the deciduous dentition the permanent successors below each of these deciduous teeth when they erupt they require enough space to come into occlusion in the proper manner these anthropoid space is important for the proper occlusion so the physiological spaces are between each and every teeth and the anthropoidal space is seen typically between the canine and the lateral incisor in the maxillary arch and they are present distal to the mandibular canine in the mandibular arch so this compensate for the larger size of the permanent teeth the mixed dentition phase begins at the age of six when the permanent first molar erupts posterior to the e 
the arch dimensions the arch height the bicanine width the bimolar width all of them start to increase with age when this increases the physiological spaces also tend to increase there is a concept called as leeway space of nuts when we look at the deciduous molars the d and the e the permanent counterparts are premolars the 4 and the 5 4 is smaller than the d 5 is smaller than the e when the deciduous teeth are lost they give away more space than required for the premolars to come in that location this excess space that the deciduous molars occupy are called as the leeway space generally the difference is such that the deciduous canine and the molars are bigger than the permanent premolars and the canines the difference between the deciduous and the permanent is called as leeway space of nuts roughly they are 3.4 mm in the mandibular arch 1.8 mm in the maxillary arch accounting for 1.7 mm on each side of the mandibular arch and 0.9 mm on each quadrant of the maxillary arch leeway space is essential which allows the mesial drifting of the permanent first molar and allows for the proper alignment of the premolars and the incisors when the leeway space is less there may be crowding and the permanent premolars may not have enough space to erupt leading to malocclusion another concept in occlusion is incisal liability the mesial distal width of the permanent incisors are bigger than the deciduous incisors so when the permanent teeth erupt they don't have enough space because the deciduous teeth were occupying much lesser space so to compensate for this generally the permanent teeth in the maxillary arch erupt labial to the deciduous teeth in maxillary arch the incisor liability is 6 to 7 mm in the mandibular arch it is 5 to 6 mm whenever the permanent incisors are erupting there may be a transient crowding that may be seen and to correct this orthodontists generally use the leeway space the spacing or they may extract a premolar to compensate for the crowding that may be in the later stages when you look at the permanent dentition generally the arch form is elliptical there may be a square or a v shaped arch that may be seen in some populations this is how the maxillary and the mandibular teeth overlap if you look closely the maxillary 8 and the mandibular 1 are the only two teeth which contact with one opposing teeth rest all the teeth contact with two opposing teeth there are three important concepts the overlap of teeth which may be overjet or overbite and the curve of compensation overjet is the horizontal overlap of the arches how much horizontal distance is there between the labial surface of the mandibular incisors and the incisal ridge of the maxillary teeth this is called as overjet in class 2 cases the overjet is higher the vertical overlap on the other hand is called as the overbite overjet and overbite are important features which allows for the motion of the mandible during mastication speech etc it prevents cheek and lip bite the compensatory curves of the dental arches these are the ways in which the teeth are aligned a concept called bonville's triangle states that the two condyles and the midpoint of the central incisors they form an equilateral triangle of 4 inches the occlusal surface anterior to posterior is curved sagittally as well as coronally the maxilla appears convex and the mandible appears concave 
the curve from the anterior to the posterior aspect of the teeth going in a backward posterior upward direction is called as the curve of speed this curve is in the sagittal plane the incisal ridges the cusp of the canines premolars and the buccal cusps of the molars of the maxilla form this curve and it is an important feature to be kept note of during teeth setting for complete dentures these compensatory curves may be seen in the mandibular arch also as you can see here another concept states that if we have a big spear with the center point at the glabella with a radius of 4 inches the surface of the spear will touch all the cusps of the mandibular teeth giving rise to a concave surface of the mandibular teeth at the levels of the premolars the maxillary teeth are seen to be aligned in such a way that there is a concave curve and seen in a vertical plane this has to be kept in mind when we are setting teeth for the mandible and the maxilla in the mandibular posterior region the teeth are lingually inclined giving rise to a concave curve of wilson whereas the maxillary arch it gives a convex curve because the buccal cusps are more superiorly placed than the lingual cusps because the lingual cusps are the functional cusps the teeth are aligned parallel to the direction of the medial pterygoid muscle the medial pterygoid muscle is attached at the angle of the mandible the teeth in this particular alignment resists the maximum forces and dissipates it to the center of the skull or to the temporomandibular joint the elevated buccal cusp prevents the foot from going past the occlusal table preventing foot lodgement compensatory curves are important because it represents the neuromuscular balance compensatory curves are skewed in cases of muscle dysfunction cleft lip and palate etc compensatory curves must be reproduced for fun functional homeostasis in orthodontic therapy crowns and bridges complete dentures etc the functional form of the teeth should be kept in mind when you are reproducing individual tooth restorations the morphological features of ridges cusps the fossa and the sulcus which are the concavities they have to be kept in mind and the proper contact should be reproduced whenever you are reconstructing or restoring individual teeth the facial and the lingual relations also have to be kept in mind the way the mandibular and the maxillary incisors contact how the canine is related to the premolars and the canines which are the functional cusps which are the antagonists we have to kept in keep in mind whenever we are restoring teeth the occlusal contact has been described under a term called centric occlusion the term centric occlusion is given to the maximum intercuspation between the maxillary and the mandibular teeth whenever the teeth are in contact they may be surface to surface contact wherein you can see some incisal contact here or adjacent teeth contact with each other in the proximal surfaces the cusp and the fossa opposition is also an important thing to be kept in mind the functional cusps of the maxilla are the palatal cusps whereas the functional cusps of the mandible are the buccal cusps the palatal cusps of the maxilla occlude with the fossa of the mandibular teeth the buccal cusps of the mandibular posteriors occlude at the fossa of the maxillary posteriors centric relation on the other hand is something to do with the temporomandibular joint the posterior most and the superior most relation of the temporomandibular joint in the mandibular fossa is called as the centric relation this is the position at which the muscles are said to be at rest we have to remain aware that the centric occlusion and centric relation if they coincide that is the best occlusion 
the cusp and the embrasure opposition is also a part of occlusion the buccal cusp of the maxillary first premolar occludes with the embrasure between the mandibular first and the second premolar the triangular ridges of the buccal cusps in the maxilla occlude with the buccal grooves of the mandibular molars the cusp to fossa relationship should be reproduced accurately maxillary palatal cusp contact the mandibular central fossa mandibular buccal cusps contact the maxillary central fossa so this is a picture which shows the so maxillary arch picture which shows the maxillary arch and the central portions here and the central portions here the areas represent where the area buccal cusp where of the mandibular the buccal posterior cusp of the occlude. mandibular posterior occlude the mandibular movements are important to understand there may be lateral movements lateral protrusive movements protrusive movements as well as retrusive movements various muscles are involved for these kind of movements absolute lateral movements are slightly less restricted whereas protrusive movements is decided by the incisal contacts retrusive movements is decided by the posterior extension of the temporomandibular joint during the occlusal contact of protrusive movement the mandibular teeth move in a downward forward direction and this is decided by the contact which the mandibular incisors do with the lingual fossa of the maxillary incisors the mandibular movement may move in a horizontal plane sagittal plane or in a coronal plane and it gives a typical bow shaped movement pattern during the lateral movement it is decided by the triangular ridges of the maxillary and the mandibular teeth if you look at the working side when the mandibular teeth are moving laterally the mandible moves along the slope of the triangular ridges of the buccal cusps of the maxillary posterior this is the centric occlusion portion the non working side moves in the opposite direction the cusps follow the triangle the cusps ridges, follow the triangle the ridges oblique ridge. especially the oblique that is why we should reproduce that is the why we should reproduce the oblique ridge, ridge more during our restoration during our rest the direction in which the incisors moves is called as the incisal guidance generally this is the angle that it forms in the articulator occlusion is a complex phenomenon there are some guides to it sometimes whenever a person is moving their jaw from left to right the posterior teeth all come in contact in the working side whereas the non working side they come out of contact this is called as group function some of us may have contact only in one teeth most of the time it is the canine so if you see here when the person is moving the jaw laterally only the canine comes in contact this canine guides the occlusion this is called as canine guided occlusion any cusp or ridge interfering with the normal movement is called as interference of occlusion this may be a filling crowns and bridges and may be represented as overhangs and the patient will come with pain or uneasiness so generally whenever we do a restoration an articulating paper is used and it is placed in between the teeth and the patient is asked to clench so if you see here we are supposed to see these markings on the palatal cusps of the maxilla because they are the functional cusps but if you see markings on the buccal cusp you may have to trim them to maintain occlusion two colors of centric and eccentric positions can also be used so in this case you can make out there are a lot of contact seen in the buccal surface of the premolar here the stability of the occlusion is decided mainly by the neuromuscular integrity the tongue and the labial muscles or the buccal muscles decide the neutral zone where the teeth find their final occlusion it is also related to the pattern of the jaw teeth and the joints 
there are six important keys of occlusion that have been prescribed these are called as andrews six keys of normal occlusion these include molar interarch relationship which is decided as the angles class 1 class 2 and class 3 relationships wherein you can see the relationship between the buccal cusp and the mandibular molar grooves the mesio distal crown angulation which is decided and this is one of the ways in which the proper occlusion can be maintained if you see here the canine is angulated in a different way we restrict the term inclination because inclination is the labiolingual angulation of the teeth the teeth should not be rotated much see if you see here the premolar is rotated in such a way that it's occupying more space than it should be derotating this teeth will give rise to more space for alignment the teeth should have tight contacts there should be no gaps in between finally the curve of speed should be not more than 1.5 millimeters so these are the important features of occlusion which have to be kept in mind during restorations and proper maintenance of function. Thank you.